think we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maddie Lewis, and I'm one of the iSTEM student liaisons. And hello, my name is Mason Warren. I'm the other student liaison. And thank you for attending the faculty lightning talk of the semester titled Machine Learning and Data Science. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. So if you do not want to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. To start us off, we'd like to introduce Dr. Hossein Asghari, Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, who will be introducing our five amazing panelists. Okay. Um, thank you, Maddie and Mason. They have done an amazing job in the background to prepare everything for this meeting. So thank you very much. And also thank you, Karen, for the big help. Um, so thank you all for coming to the ISPM Lightning Talk. We have five great speakers from LMU. They are all uh, experts in machine learning and data science, all from different disciplines, working on great uh, researches related to this topic. So I hope that uh, you really like this session and becomes motivational for more uh, talks and research. So the plan for today is that, so I'm going to introduce each, each speaker by a couple of sentences. And then for some of the speakers, we have poll questions that the speaker has uh, asked us to, to put. And then uh, we will have five to seven minutes talk by each speaker. If you have any questions about uh, speakers, about the topics that they are presenting, please put them in the chat and then we, uh, we will collect them and then we will ask the speakers at the end. So we will wait for the, all the speeches to be over and then we will have the Q&A session. So uh, to start, uh, we'll start with the first uh, speaker, Dr. Thomas Laurent. Uh, he is the, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics at LMU. He uh, got his PhD in, uh, from Duke University. He did postdoc at UCLA. His research is focused on machine learning. In spe specifically in the past four years, uh, the main focus of his research is on developing new deep learning algorithms and also proving theoretical results that uh, uh, partially help to, to uh, the puzzling and poorly understood behavior, behaviors of uh, existing deep learning algorithms. So he's working on very interesting topic related to machine learning and he is also teaching interesting courses at LMU if you're interested to work on machine learning. So uh, let's start by welcoming him for his uh, short talk. Dr. Lauren, you can put up put your presentation. Okay, thank you, Hossein, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, everybody seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so thanks for the introduction. So let me be quick because I guess that's the goal. Uh, let me first show you a few. So I'm going to speak about deep learning. What is deep learning? That's a branch of machine learning that basically use big computer and big amount of data. And this has been very, very popular uh, in, the past, uh, in the past eight years. Uh, let me show some very quick uh, example. So this is posted in the chat box. So this was, uh, uh, this was uh, an article from the New York Times where you can play with this. So the link is on the chat box. And the idea is all these faces do not exist. These are not faces of people. These are just people faces that are random, I mean, that are invented by a deep learning algorithm. So these are not real people. Uh, here is other stuff that you can do with deep learning algorithms. So you see, you can change. I mean, you can artificially modify uh, lo lots of things. So this is one example of uh, stuff that uh, are done with deep learning. Let me give a few other very quick examples before I speak about what I want to speak about. So object detection, all object detection algorithm nowadays are done with deep learning algorithm. Um, let me send a quick link. Uh, let me send a quick link also uh, about object detection so that you can see uh, in real life. What? Okay, so you have a link in the chat box here. So just look at it for 20 seconds to see what it looks like. I'm not playing it on my laptop because of Zoom. It uh, doesn't look good if I play it uh, on Zoom. So just watch the first 30 seconds and you get clearly an idea of what's happening. You just see in real time object has been detecting and labeled. So this is something which is done a lot nowadays. It's all rely 
uh, on deep learning algorithm. Uh, something you might be familiar also, and which obviously is a worrying thing, is what people call deep fakes. So let me send you a quick link also. Okay, here you have a link. So that should be this video. So you can have a look just for 30 seconds. You will see the ID is someone is speaking and you can put the movement of the mouth, the eyes and everything on the face of anybody Yeah, So you can make fake video by doing this kind of thing. Uh, these are some application of deep learning, which obviously are very concerning. Uh, there are lots of very positive application um, uh, so you have lots of application with natural language processing. We are now the most applicable. I mean, lots of things are done in natural language processing with deep learning. I think Mandy uh, will speak uh, uh, about it. Uh, you have lots of application in robotics. You have lots of application in medicine. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop here with application. So the idea is what is deep learning? It is what you do when you have a huge amount of data and huge computational power. So these are new type of algorithms that have been developed roughly since 2012 to use huge amount of data and huge computational power. Uh, some, like going back to applications, some applications that uh, almost exclusively rely on deep learning algorithm are all what is image recognition nowadays based on deep learning algorithm. So image and face recognition uh, voice recognition work also on deep learning algorithms. So when you speak into your smartphone or anything that recognizes voice nowadays, and which is well done, will be based on deep learning algorithm. Google Translate is exclusively deep learning algorithm. When you do a Google search, the way Google understands what you're typing in the search box is also uh, using a deep learning algorithm. Okay, so. Uh, what do I want to speak uh, uh, about? So uh, all these deep learning algorithms, which nowadays are massively used in, the, in industry, uh, all rely uh, on the same algorithm and on the same mathematical concept, uh, we, uh, which is called gradient descent. So the idea for all this uh, deep learning uh, technology and algorithm, and I, Actually, most machine learning algorithms rely on this also. So most machine learning algorithms rely on finding the minimum of a function, uh, which is called the loss, okay? Uh, so typically, you have a function which is like this in high dimension, and you are trying to find the minimum, so which in this case uh, would be here. And the way we find the minimum of such function is basically by rolling a ball in this function. So you put a ball, let's say here, and you let it roll on, on, on this surface and you will reach the minimum of the function. So that's basically how you, uh, that's basically the algorithm on which all this deep learning and most machine learning algorithm rely on. It is, you have a function like this, you put a ball here and you roll the ball to the bottom of the function. And this is how the algorithm uh, this is how the algorithm works. What has happened in 2012, and so that was the big break between classical machine learning and uh, deep learning, it is, it is the following. It is before 2012, all the classical statistics and machine learning algorithms were dealing with nice uh, loss function, which we are all which is called convex. So they are functions which have a nice shape. And so the idea is, you know, if the function is like this, you know that if you roll a ball into this function, you will reach, uh, the, you will reach the minimum of, of this function. Uh, people were doing deep learning before 2012, but it was considered a very bad idea. Why is it? Because in deep learning, the loss function look like a complete mess. This look like this, okay? you still roll a ball into this function to try to find the minimum, but you agree that's just a bad idea, okay? Uh, how do you find the minimum of a function which is a complete mess like this? So you still had some people that were doing this and were saying, no, we should do this. But most people were, I mean, all the community was making fun of these people because the function is terrible. It's just a bad scientific idea to roll a ball to find the minimum of this function. 
And so uh, before 2012, you mostly had like three big group of people that were still doing this technique, like rolling a ball in a function which is a mess, and they got all their paper rejected, and they were basically paria in the community, and people were making fun of them. And for good reason, that's just a bad idea that shouldn't work. One shouldn't try to do something like this. Uh, in 2012, for the first time, people started to be good uh, dealing with GPU and large amount of data. And it's turned out that so every, there was a huge machine learning competition that was taking place every year, okay, which was called the ImageNet competition. 2012 was the first time that one of these three group uh, doing this bad scientific idea, which is deep learning, use a GPU and big amount of data to do their algorithm. And they completely destroyed the competition. Something that had never happened. Like uh, it was like it, it was. I mean, uh, they obtained 16% of error, whereas everybody else were at basically 26, 27% of error. That might not seem a lot, but this was uh, it was an earthquake in the community when this happened. So before 2012, everybody were making fun of these techniques that are called deep learning techniques, just because, I mean, and they were right to make fun, except that in 2012, it suddenly happened that this terrible scientific idea turned out to give results which are way, way better than everything else. After 2012, like everybody is doing deep learning. That has become completely uh, the dominant uh, trend. Uh, in 2018, the three leaders of the three group that were doing deep learning before 2012 and were made fun of all got the Turing Award, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in computer science. Uh, so, yes, so, and now we are completely in this deep learning era, meaning that uh, these algorithms work amazingly well. It is still bad science. We still don't understand why it's work. We still have no guarantee, no idea, and no clue why it is working. Just we have to use them because they're so much better than the algorithms that, that, that we understand. But it's kind of the beginning of a new scientific era in data analysis in the sense that it's clearly something amazing. We clearly have no clue why it is working, but it's just working uh, uh, amazingly well. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I think I'm, I didn't look at how much time I took, but I guess I did my five to seven minutes. Yes. Oh, let me just very quickly. I want to advertise that uh, I am teaching this deep learning class every fall semester, and typically the class run from 6:30 to 7:45 p.m. And you need to have some idea of linear algebra, some idea of vector calculus, and some idea of Python programming. But I'm very open. If you don't have the correct background, we can work out something on, on the side. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Dr. Laurent. Amazing talk. It's really difficult to talk about such a big field in five to seven minutes. I totally understand. You did an amazing job. I highly recommend all the students to reach out to these five speakers. Uh, machine learning is a very hot topic in any field that you are. If you add machine learning to it, you are going to get very good jobs. So you can have that from me. Uh, so if you have questions from Dr. Laurent, please put them in the chat. At the end, I, I, we will go through them and you can ask him. So let's go to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is Dr. Anna Bargagliotti. Uh, she is a professor of mathematics at LMU. Uh, she received her PhD degree in mathematics from UC Irvine in 2007. She also received her master's degree in statistics from UCLA in 2007. Uh, she joined the Department of Mathematics at LMU in 2011. Her research interests include data visualization, multivariate models, non-parametric statistics, and statistics education. So she has asked us to put uh, two polls, um, uh, uh, interesting polls, so we can basically ask uh, from the audiences. Okay, so it seems now the poll is up. Please choose uh, for each of these two questions uh, your uh, what you think is the proper answer. And then um, Dr. Bag Bargagliotti uh, will uh, talk about the result. Okay. So currently we have uh, 46 out of 60 participants.
52 out of 60. Great, great participants, 93% participated. 57 out of 60, perfect. So I think now we have all the votes, we can share the result. Uh, it seems for the first one, how much do you think statistics and data science impact your day, daily life a lot? And how important is it for you to have a good understanding of statistics and data science seems between very important and important. So with that, let's welcome Dr. Bargagliotti. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Can, can everybody hear me? I've been having uh, volume issues all day. Okay, great. Well, that, this is great because that means I don't have to convince you in five minutes that statistics and data science are important or that it impacts you every day. Um, so how do I get there? Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to briefly just touch on some things about just statistics today and what data science looks like today. Um, mostly in images, I'm just going to speak in images, really. Uh, just these are some things that are affecting our daily lives. Obviously, the coronavirus has been what we've been discussing for a year now, almost, right? Um, it's nonstop. We um, climate change data and mapping climate change data over time. Um, we have social movements going on that have a lot of data to them, um, specifically discussing how marginalized, how groups are being marginalized and what that looks like. And then last Sunday, we were talking about the amazing Tom Brady, who said somehow never is a superhero and never fails and all his statistics um, that go along with him. Right. So. Okay. All right. So in general, statistics is really about understanding the world around us. Um, and as a statistician, what happens is that we actually view the world through data. Um, but data is not the reality in itself. It's actually a model for reality. So we look at this lens of data as modeling what we actually feel and what we actually realize in, um, in the world. These are my specific things that on a daily basis that I, um, I've been living with and data for the last several months. So I get a COVID update from my city every single night and I sift through these statistics and I've been plotting them for months now and I, I kind of track what's happening, the ups and downs. Um, and then a few months ago, I bought an iWatch and I track a lot of stuff about my iWatch and what I do and I track my walks. As you can see last week, I walked from 6.07 a.m. to 7.47. I walked all the way down to Dr. LaRon's house and back and then um, track some information about me. I was going pretty slow too that day, right? But I track all this going on, right? Every day of my life now. So this is how I interact with data in a conscious way throughout um, my day. Um, overall, though, data is really, truly all around us. And we have something in statistics that we really refer to as sort of this problem solving process. And we use sort of four components to really guide us in research about statistics in general. And we attack problems, data related problems. We kind of formulate a question and that could be like a research question, a topic or in a data set. And then we sort of collect or consider data, consider data in a lot of cases, because now data are just being collected so often that then we kind of get them as a secondary data set to analyze and we analyze it and then we interpret those results to try to answer our original topic okay in our religious conversation um, now what we see though and throughout this process is we see that questioning really takes a role in everything we do in statistics so we create questions like broad topic questions that we try to address using data but then we have things questioning also in data collection we ask interrogate we interrogate data we could have survey questions to design a data collection or interrogate where did the data come from? Is this a representative sample? Um, was this just co uh, cre or collected automatically on some type of trigger? How did this work? What was the data collection process? And then we analyze using specific questions. And you can take topics, any topic. How close is, it, is the economy to pre-pandemic normalcy? This was uh, from two days ago on, um, on uh, 538. This was one of their topics, right, for the day. And you could collect data and do a statistical study to analyze something like that and answer that type of question. Could a single vaccine um, work against all coronaviruses? I, this was from the New York Times yesterday. 
Um, from the LA Times uh, two days ago, the powerful synthetic opioid fentanyl is behind rising deaths in the homeless population. And although this is not phrased like a, like a question, we could rephrase this into a question. All these statements and all these questions have data, a data-driven study behind it. Um, and there's power in doing things with data. So Specifically, on a daily basis, we are really living in the data deluge at this point. Um, in 2020, approximately 1.7 megabytes of digital data were created and stored every second for every person on Earth. Um, so this is a heck of a lot of data, whereas what Mandy and Dr. Toma were just talking about that so what do we do with those? And that's where these machine learning algorithms come in and deep learning algorithms come in to try to sift through these amounts, these enormous amounts of data that we are creating every day. Um, but today, data are not only traditional um, sort of quantitative and categorical variables. Data are, in fact, pictures. Um, a lot of us participate in social media, and we track our lives in pictures. That's data about what you're doing. Text, um, sound, video, all these are new data models, new data um, types that we have today. Um, it's important to note that data can tell broad and big stories, which are things that we typically kind of tend to go for but it can also really tell personal stories. How is my health doing? How am I doing in a week, in a month, or in the past 10 months in a pandemic? What is my state of health or whatnot, right? So these are, there's a personal level <coughs> in statistics and data science that we can approach it as. Um, sorry, you guys, I just got done teaching for like three hours. So, <coughs> so that statistical investigative process that I put out before stands as a model to help us sift through all data types, truly all data types and all types of studies, broad ones and also personal ones. So I'm just going to leave everybody with the following. Statistics and data science are really here to serve other disciplines. It's a service discipline and um, each discipline or topic or study specific study or data set necessitates different statistical techniques. And new develop new techniques, new statistical techniques are developed all of the time. Um, if you are interested in this sort of thing, I'll give a little bit of plug for the math department that's starting this fall. We are going to start a new statistics and data science major and a new statistics and data science minor that has lots of classes in CS and also in the math department in statistics and deep learning and machine learning. So I will leave you guys there. Thank you, Dr. Bagak Liuti. Great talk, amazing research. Um, in the uh, for the next speaker, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Uh, Kala Seal, and he is the chair of the Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics at LMU. He is also director of Comparative Management Systems CMS program at LMU. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Seal is a professor. Uh, uh, and he's a member of the College of Business Administration since 1990s. Uh, prior to joining LMU, he has worked as an assistant executive engineer for the largest oil and natural gas uh, corporation in India. Along with his teaching at LMU, he is also uh, working as consultant for JPL and Mattel Incorporations. Um, he is also act as an active researcher and he has publication in a very good leading journals like Interfaces, International Journal, journal of Mobile Marketing, Informs Transactions on Education and many others. Uh, he has worked extensively in the area of application of mobile phones in business. His current teaching and research interest is in uh, business analytics area and he teaches data modeling and visualization at uh, LMU's uh, Masters of Business Analytics uh, program. So we are very fortunate fortunate to have him. Dr. Sil, uh, you can start your presentation. You are muted, Dr. C. You are muted. I'm just double checking, just finding out because I've started sharing, you know, awesome. before unmuting myself. So I think everybody's good now. Yes. 
Okay, thank you again. You know, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Ashgari and thank Thomas and um, Anna for kind of, you know, setting the stage. Um, mine is very short. I'm going to take it a little bit from the business side with some applications and kind of showing the overall, what I call the ecosystem of this. So of the data science, uh, business analytics, whatever you call it. So I call it machine learning from boring to ultra sexy. Okay, so there are multiple parts out here that now you know that people do not see. You know, and I kind of you know mentioned that a little bit, and yet they are very very important. So once again, you know, my name is Kala Kala Sil, and I'm in the information systems and business analytics area. And as Professor Asgari said, we also have a master's in business analytics that we are offering from the College of Business Administration. It's a one year program. So first, the ultra sexy part. Let me see if this works. You know. Uh, on here, otherwise I am going to put in the chat. It's a pleasure yeah, to be good. here in Las Vegas to present to you. Now I get invited to do keynotes across the globe. And while it's easy for me to be here in Las Vegas, it isn't always easy for me to travel across the world. And even when I do, I can't always speak the local language. Well, what if neither language nor distance mattered for me to deliver a fantastic keynote? What if technology could help me be anywhere I needed to be and speak any language I wanted? Well, it can. We are bringing together the power of mixed reality and Azure AI services to create a truly game-changing experience. What you're about to see is an exact hologram of me wearing the same outfit that we recently captured at a mixed reality studio. And I don't speak Japanese, but what if I wanted to deliver my keynote in Japanese? Using Azure AI technology, I can translate my English into Japanese and train it to sound exactly like me. The same voice tones, those same inflections. Now we brought this together, my hologram and Azure AI to show you what's possible. So first I'm gonna put on my HoloLens 2 here and then we'll flip in the room to a special camera so you can see exactly what I'm seeing. Let's get started. First, let me introduce you to Mini-Me. There she is, my perfect holograph. And thanks to the power of HoloLens 2, she just floats right with me. I'm literally holding my hologram, so natural. Now she's a little small to do a keynote. So let's get her up so she can do full-size Japanese keynote. Render keynote. So as you can see that, you know, the power of deep learning and the machine learning can create some amazing, amazing applications with immediate translation, holographic projection, and different kinds of things. There are actually, you know, a lot more, you know, as I said, that the sexy applications that are happening. So, and we can think of that are, it's right here. So for example, there is a lead, you know, in, in the retail, I'm in the business, so I have to talk about business a little bit. So in the retail sector, for example, in the digital marketing nowadays, finding out the lead, you know, doing the recommendation, what you can see right in Netflix, you know, understanding that whether this particular potential customer is going to buy or not, you know, should you really send them a message or should you spend the money on advertising for reaching out this particular group? All of these are now driven by um, artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm behind them. Uh, recently in MIT 2020 list of the technologies, they're talking about AI discovered molecule. So what is happening is that uh, the artificial intelligence or the machine learning algorithm is going through different kinds of molecular structures of the different types of drugs that are beneficial to us and trying to see what combinations are going to work. Now, the brute force approach is going to be huge. It's 10 to the power of 60 combinations, which is just mind boggling. But, uh, but they are looking at the machine learning and using that machine learning algorithm, they're trying to find out what combinations have the best chance of actually succeeding and being beneficial. So this will really, really make the drug discovery super fast and finding out drugs for curing different kinds of things. Uh, let's see, we have tiny AI. 
So what are the tiny AI because of the improvement in the hardware and as well as in the software, nowadays, you know, the CD translation, all of these different kinds of things that actually needs to go back to a server, needs an internet connection that will not be needed because all of these small machines will be embedded in your mobile phone. It will be embedded in the tracker or the Apple watch that Anna, Anna just uh, talked about. It will be embedded in little, you know, internet of things, any, any wearables that you have. So all of those things, again, you know, are going to be possible. Take a look at here, the Pinterest, they use AI to understand the images and create a context, context out of them so that as you are posting more and more of your images and the descriptions, they will figure out how to group them together and provide the context. You know, so a story can be created out of that. You know, talk about deep fake, talk about creating a complete alternate reality and AI and the machine learning is kind of you know, taking you there. So that's the sexy part, right? It's like, oh my God, you know, how do I get there? How do I actually make it happen? You know, I want my hands on this. I'm sure that you know, all of you are excited to know how to make it happen. Unfortunately, the road to that sexiness is kind of, you know, built with a little bit of boring things, just like in life. I mean, take a, think about the big picture. When you want to get a house, you know, you have to start somewhere. And where do you start? You start with this, building blocks, right? Data. Take a look at this. This is what is happening in our life. Every second, every minute, you know, every time there is an interaction, there is so much of data that are being created you know, huge, huge amount of data that are being created and being stored. So that's what we start with. Then we go into our tools. You have to understand what those tools are. You have to know how to use those tools. Where do you need the power tools? Where you need, you know, just a small little screwdriver. So that is programming languages. Those are the software packages that are needed. Then comes the planning, right? If you think of the house, design, plan, process. And this is where the, you know, the big guys like Thomas, big guys like Anna, you know, with all of their statistical, mathematical knowledge, all of the models, all of these wonderful different things, you know, the deep learning network, you know, just even simple regression equation, you know, different kind of random forest algorithm, all of these things are coming over here as an application. And then what you get, you get to this. This is your final destination. This is what you want to do, right? This is where the applications are. This is where we started with. You know, so be it playing chase with a human being and a robot, be it the fake faces and the videos that are being created, you know, natural language processing applications, all of those kind of things. I just wanted to show you this. That's because I know, yes, this is boring, usually, right? You know, but for some people, it may not be. Um, this is somewhat sexy. And this is the ultra sexy. But what I want to, you to know that uh, to be able to get to ultra sexy, you have to start with the boarding first. And number two is there is a huge carrier that's in this area. That's in this area. I don't know if you notice that, you know, when Thomas said that he's going to teach his deep learning, he wants you to know the mathematics. He wants you to know the Python programming, right? So all of these little things, you know, understanding the data, the statistics, those are needed. And there is a huge carrier in it. You know, and you might find it really, really exciting once you get to it. And that's because it gives you the skill to actually build that house. It gives you that skill to understand what is needed to get out there. You just cannot start becoming a data science. You have to start with this. So I just wanted to tell you that and kind of, you know, give you a overall perspective and show you that depending on what is your interest in, there are careers in each of these areas. Okay, and one such career that's really, really taking off is in data. Literally chief data officers nowadays, there is actually a post called chief data officer who just manages data, okay? With the big data, the cloud computing that's coming in, the databases and data cleaning. If you start with really bad data, dirty data, believe me, you know, if you build a house where the bricks are not strong and your stills are not really that good and your wood is already rotten, that house is not going to stand for too long. So you have to understand that. You have to understand that how to build that. And there is a huge career in it along with everything else. So with that, I'm just going to kind of, you know, stop. Just, just wanted to show you that and give you an overall picture of what is happening and how can you go, get from one point to another point. Here are my sources. And with that, I will stop my five minutes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seen.
Amazing. It's really great to see how many different perspectives in all of these different perspectives is still there's a lot of great research done related to machine learning and data science. Um, so thank you, Dr. Seal. By the way, so Dr. Toll shared a link on the chat to one of the pictures that Dr. Seal mentioned. I don't know if he used the Google's image search or not, but that becomes a very good example of machine learning. When you give it a, if you take a picture and put it on Google image, you can find which picture on internet looks like this. It becomes a very good example of AI and machine learning. So the, uh, by the way, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and at the end we will uh, go through the questions. The next speaker is Dr. Mandy Korposik. Uh, she is assist assistant professor of computer science at LMU. She received her PhD in computer science uh, from MIT. Uh, her primary research interests include natural language processing and a spoken language understanding for dialogue systems. Uh, she uses deep learning models to build the, uh, she has used deep learning models to build the Coco nutritionist application for iOS. It's an application for cell phones that allows obesity patients uh, to more easily track the food they eat by speaking naturally. Her long-term research goal is to deploy a collection of AI based uh, conversational agents that improve the health, well-being, and productivity of people. So AI means artificial intelligence. So we are very fortunate to have her here. Uh, Dr. Korpusik, please start. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Asgari. As he said, I'm Dr. Korpusik, and I'm in the Department of Computer Science. This is just my second year at LMU, and I specialize in natural language processing, or NLP for short. So what is NLP? Um, it's the intelligent understanding of human language and that can be written or spoken um, by computers. So to give you a sense of the variety of applications that fall under the subfield, spam filtering is probably the simplest one where you have your email coming in and then it just checks, is it spam or not spam? Google search is another big one. It has to figure out from the user query, what is the most relevant document and answer your question. Translation, which Dr. Tamala Rant talked about, um, is taking a source sentence, a source language sentence, and then translating it to a target language. Um, and finally, what I specialize in is this conversational agent like Alexa and Siri and Cortana. To give you a bit of history on the approaches that have been used over time, and we're gonna start overlapping again um, with Dr. Laurent at the end of this. In the 60s to the 80s was more of a rule-based era where the focus was actually on linguistics and deep semantic knowledge. Um, and I've shown here Noam Chomsky, he's MIT emeritus professor and known as the father of modern linguistics. Then in the 90s started moving towards machine learning, um, less emphasis on linguistics and more learning from lots and lots of data like Dr. Colosiel mentioned. And Julia Hirschberg who I've shown here is um, one of the early uh, professors at Columbia University in the field of NLP. So I actually, she's one of my personal mentors. I got a chance to work with her as an undergraduate. So to show you kind of at a high level, what is uh, machine learning doing? It's just seeing thousands or even millions of labeled examples. And going back to that simple spam filtering example, we have the email coming in as the input to the model. And then your model is making a prediction and it knows what the correct answer, it will see the correct answer so it can check if it was right or if it was wrong. So it might say, oh, it's spam, but it was actually not spam. And it'll update itself, its parameters and iterate through this process many, many times until it gets really good at making the correct prediction by the end. And now we enter, um, as was mentioned earlier in 2012, the deep learning era. And I've shown here, Jeffrey Hinton, known as the father of neural networks, a uh, University of Toronto professor, um, and to show you kind of what this looks like, it's just a very powerful type of machine learning model. As mentioned before, it used to be um, not trained properly, but now it is, and we have lots and lots of data and computation power, and it's inspired, so the name comes from the human neurons in the human brain. So this gives you a visual where each of the circles is a neuron, and they're connected in a series of layers with these arrows that I've shown. So in NLP, your input is gonna be text. So it might be a sentence, a sequence of words, 
And then let's say it's um, a sentiment analysis task where you're predicting the correct emotion. Your output would be which emotion has the highest probability. So here may be happy is the most likely output. Um, as Dr. Asgari said, I focus on dialogue systems and spoken language understanding. Uh, so to illustrate how this works, you'll have the user query coming in. Maybe they said they're drinking a glass of Tropicana orange juice. And typically the first step will be to detect the user's intent. What is their goal with that query? Here it's to log a new meal. And then after that, you may have semantic tagging. So for each word in your sentence, you're going to identify what the correct tag is. So a glass would be a quantity, Tropicana is the brand, and juice is the food. And then the last step would be mapping to the database to retrieve some um, structured data back. So for us, we work on nutrition. The USDA food database is the back end, and it might return like the calories, the carbohydrates, the fat, the protein. Or it might ask for a follow-up question, like, did you have pulp in your orange juice? Um, and also mentioned was uh, we built, so when I was doing my PhD at MIT, we actually put this system into an iOS app as the prototype. So it's in the Apple store now. Um, we launched it in 2019, two years later, it's almost 40,000 downloads. So we're collecting a lot of data that will help these models improve um, on real world data. So hopefully this, you'll be able to hear this demo. I had an apple with two tablespoons of peanut butter. So you tap the microphone icon, log what you ate. And this is the first step that I mentioned, semantic tagging, where you identify the quantity and then the food. And then the database mapping piece comes next. So it actually predicted smooth peanut butter. If that's not correct, there are uh, top 15 options. So I changed it to chunky. Here's a history of all my meals. And finally, a breakdown of all the nutrients that you've been eating for the day, the week, or the month. So you can see in purple is all my fat content. So from all the nut butter, um, very high fat diet. And for fun, I thought I'd play some of the recordings. So you get data from uh, all over the world, users, not just in the US who have accents. Omelette with two eggs, half a cup tomato. Lots of users in the UK, Australia, many in China. <laughs> Half of a cheese quesadilla. A There's background noise. And you can go, um, ham sandwich, please. Oh, that's it. And people explaining how to use it to their friends. And you'll notice in this case, she said, you can go ham sandwich, please. Which series recognizer incorrectly transcribed as you can go camping with us, please. So there is an issue still with even the very first step, which is just speech recognition, converting the speech into the text, which then we process with the NLP. Um, so I'm working on a lot of these problems now with students at LMU. So um, previously, Kira Toll was working on this nutrition specific speech recognizer, and now a master student Brian Moncada is working on it. There is a senior capstone team called Daily Bites. They're um, doing recipe recommendations using the Spoonacular API. And uh, master student Rachit Patel is also working on personalized recommender system uh, for foods using collaborative filtering and content based. Um, Maya Epps and Juan Uribe are sophomores and they just published a paper on a new data set for spoken exercise logging complementary to the food logging. Uh, last month at the Spoken Language Technology Workshop. So hopefully with enough data, we're thinking you can maybe learn patterns on how people felt when they were exercising and relate that to what they ate beforehand. Um, and then ongoing work in multiple modalities. So a lot of users just want to take a photo of their meal. This is getting outside of the realm of NLP now, but uh, Rosetta Hu is a first year and she has built a a food image classifier. And so we're gonna see if we can combine two inputs, both speech and language and get even better performance. Um, so hopefully with the spoken dialogue technology that our group is developing at LMU, people will be able to more easily and efficiently track their uh, diet and their exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much, amazing, great app. So I forgot, uh, uh, Dr. Um, 
Korpusik, uh, she sent us a very cool poll that I forgot to put on. If it is possible, can you put it on? I think that would be really fun for the audience to play with. So uh, yeah, so in this research, so there is a, basically a human uh, uh, talking to an AI machine. So our question for you is that the black one, the black sentences, it belongs to one person and the red uh, sentence, it, they belong to a, another person. So now we want to put on this poll. You tell us which one is a human, which one is the chatbot, is the AI. Let's see if we can determine which one is the actual human. So I think that would be fun to see. So we have, it seems it's, it's taking people are thinking, it's not that easy to determine. That's interesting. Yeah. In the meantime, maybe Dr. Corpus, you could explain. Yeah, so there are a lot of uh, text generation models and language, really powerful language models that companies like Google, OpenAI are developing. Um, and it can be applied to chatbots. So a lot of times you might see an article or something where they're saying, actually, this was written, like surprise, this is all a chatbot um, because it sounds so human-like. It's just learning on such massive amounts of data off of the internet um, that it has become really, really good at sounding human-like. So we have 80% um, participation, 84%. Let's wait a couple of seconds. It's not that easy to determine, apparently. Okay, I think, yeah, so I think you have 86%. I don't see any new coming. So, okay, so if you take a look, uh, it was not that easy. It looks, it was not that easy to determine which one was the human. So Dr. Korpasik, what, which one do you think? <laughs> uh, I know, I'm like, do I remember which one? Um, the one where it was talking about the movie. So red was the chatbot, I believe. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So perfect. So it still, it seemed majority could determine the red was the <laughs> chatbot. But I think as the AI becomes more and more expert, you know, I think that's, um, you know, become more difficult to, to determine. Thank you. Great, Paul. Um, so our uh, last uh, 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 speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Lei Huang, she is a full professor of electrical and computer engineering at LMU. She received her PhD degree in electrical engineering from USC, University of Southern California in 2003. Um, she, she was a research scholar at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, she had research experience at Microsoft Research Asia in Beijing in China and also in Ericsson Eurolab in Germany. She joined the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in 2003. Her research interest uh, uh, includes digital image and video coding, multimedia applications in wired and wireless networks, data security in cloud computing and deep learning applications. Recently, she has developed interest in engineering educational research aiming at integration of machine learning to uh, undergraduate engineering uh, curriculum. So we are very fortunate to have her as our last speaker. Dr. Huang, please. Thank you, Dr. Asghari. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, I think every uh, all the previous speakers has talked a lot about, you know, what is deep learning. Uh, Dr. Laurent actually uh, was developing, uh, has been developing the deep learning algorithms, uh, but I am actually using the algorithms that he develops and then uh, apply it to some engineering problem solving. Okay, so uh, I will try to be more application um, uh, oriented. I know uh, Dr. Seal also talked about all the core applications in the business, business field. And Dr. Kopersik also talked about the natural language processing and how this could be used in more like uh, broader context, right? But uh, my, uh, so, okay. So I guess I can skip this slide because uh, has been uh, 
I think uh, said before, uh, well said before. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the uh, deep learning tasks that make all this amazing application uh, possible. And uh, particularly the visual recognition, I know uh, a lot of previous talk also talked about this, uh, including object recognition, object localization, object detection, and object tracking, um, and also uh, action understanding. So these are all kind of human level intelligence that computers are, you know, it's, it's kind of easier for us, right? So uh, to recognize what are the project in an image to track like the object through a video sequence and, and to understand what are the uh, video is about, right? So that's kind of natural to us. However, uh, this might be very, this could be very difficult to computers because uh, computers is better at computation, right? But it's much worse as at uh, recognition, at, at this kind of cognition. Um, so I think deep learning is the most state of the art technology that are trying to bridge this gap between computation and cognition, recognition. Okay, so uh, the other, I'm not going to talk about the other type of tasks. I'm going to uh, give you some idea of visual recognition, especially what I'm doing, I'm, how I'm using it in some of the projects, engineering projects. Okay, so uh, so let's let's do a fun game. I know uh, some of you might have seen this before from my last talk in the college, but uh, I know most a lot of you are, are uh, new students. So uh, visual recognition is to is trying to uh, identify what's the main object in a certain image, right? So like in this example, so we can all identify which one is a puppy, which one is a muffin, right? Uh, so. But how do we do that? You might think of, oh, um, the puppy has like two eyes, one nose and a mouth and uh, sub, uh, two ears. So it's kind of um, fluffy, uh, uh, but the muffin has a very different texture, has a very different shape, right? So uh, that's, that's, maybe that's what, how we recognize the objects, but <laughs> let's look at this. Maybe not, right? So uh, different shapes, different colors may not be that different anymore in some objects, in some very different objects. So this is, uh, you know, those are uh, images with very similar patterns, very similar features that, you know, maybe we, we are kind of confused at first seeing, right? So, but if we look closer, if we kind of look, um, closer to each of the picture, we can easily recognize which one is a puppy, which one is a muffin still, right? So it's not a daunting, like difficult task for human beings, for human brains. However, computers see all these pictures are very similar data. So they are, they're just those zeros and ones in such a similar pattern, right? So uh, for the computers, this could be be really difficult, okay? And deep learning and technology actually provides the tool that makes this possible for computers. Um, of course, it has a lot of math. It has a lot of like data science and a lot of computer science, and it has to deal with the business size of uh, business aspect of all the applications. But as an engineer, I'm more interested in recognizing those objects that are that are interesting to our engineers, right? So, uh, for uh, for example, the um, one of the project we have done uh, is the long nodule detection from CT images. This is more like a bioengineering kind of project, and we also tried some other medical image analysis. So we're not interested in telling which one is puppy, which one is muffin, but we want to tell giving a CT lung image, which one has a potential problem, right? So which one could be potentially developed to some disease, right? So that's uh, what we are trying to find. And then we also did some uh, diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy diagnosis. Okay, so those kind of pictures uh, looks somewhat similar, but there are subtle differences. Um, then how do we sort 
out those differences and find out which one is 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 healthy, which one is not healthy. Okay, and also uh, this probably is more related to civil engineering. Uh, so we also did some kind of big picture, like big images uh, detection. We're trying to find the, like road cracks and potholes or sewer pipe. Um, problems. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to give you some kind of examples of each of those pictures. What does they look like? And so for lung nodule detection and uh, also the, uh, uh, the other kind of medical images, they usually, you know, it's very normal that we are looking for some very detailed differences, right? But for the civil engineering, we're looking for something bigger, something more uh, salient to tell, right? So, uh, however, there could be a lot of noises in uh, those kind of easier, we, we think it's easier to tell, but there could be noises. So how do we dif like differentiate between the noise and the real problems, right? So like this one is a shadow. So, um, if we, uh, you know, if the computer uh, algorithm could wrongly think this is a uh, pothole or a, a kind of defection on the road surface, then uh, that 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 means we should improve the um, algorithm. Okay, so so those algorithms are particularly uh, tailored to some specific applications that are we are interested in different field okay so uh i think that's my focus uh not not doing the general kind of algorithm de development but more specifically tailored to uh, what we are trying to find in the application okay pothole detection we're now trying to use the dash cam video and then trying to use those video um, images, the images from those videos to detect pothole. The idea is this could be uh, relieve a lot of like labor intensive work for civil engineers who are trying to maintain the road on a daily basis. Okay, so uh, sewer so pipe inspection, this is also, uh, you know, one of the projects that the Department of Water and Power, they are interested in to automating their um, maintenance and inspection process. Okay, so save a lot of engineers, save a lot of time, and of course, save a lot of money. Uh, and also, we have also tried some uh, other type of speech classification, uh, like silent speech classification. Uh, this is one of the projects we did uh, almost uh, two years ago. Um, so uh, we used the uh, so this is more, this is less visual, but more uh, speech related signal, one dimensional signal classification. Okay, so uh, we have also, so this is similar to what uh, Dr. Kopasik was doing uh, more, uh, but we are trying some different ways of doing it. So using the 2D, uh, so changing the 1D image into a 2D um, to the uh, inputs, and then we're trying to use the 2D CNN models to do the classification. Okay, so, uh, and uh, as Dr. Asgari said, I'm also interested in how to uh, integrate this machine learning technology into our existing engineering uh, learning. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, learning py pyramid. I, I think it's, it's very, uh, commonly referred to as in educational research. Um, you know, they, uh, they kind of, they said that, uh, what is an effective learning method, right, strategy? Okay, so you take a course, you go to the lecture, you're listening to the lecture, you're reading the book, uh, but all of those, the first four layers are all like uh, passive learning. And then the last three are kind of active learning. So the deeper you go, the better you can learn. Okay, so I see this kind of connection between machine learning and our human learning. Um, actually, it's not too much different, uh, but it's just, um, I summarize it as the deeper, the better. Okay, so as a conclusion, I just want to give you a big picture of uh, this whole talk, where, where do we fall? Uh, 
today. Okay, so uh, we are talking about a very exciting artificial intelligence, um, app, uh, you know, world of artificial intelligence, right? All the cool applications that AI can bring to us that make machine even more intelligent than human beings someday. Uh, but the one of the big technology that is used to implement this artificial intelligence is machine learning, right? So, and machine learning has a lot of st statistics method, uh, but more recently it's all driven by data, okay? So um, the big data and the high performance computers are the two driving wheels behind this rapid development of machine learning technology, uh, especially in the deep learning technology, okay? So which you deal with massive amounts of data. And uh, it, it's ha it has been proven, right? The deeper, the better. So uh, I think my message to the, all the students is, yeah, so uh, don't just, uh, you know, limit yourself to the classroom. Uh, go to find interesting projects. Go to participate in some kind of, uh, you know, research uh, projects. And then the, you, you are actually going to get active learning, and which is a deeper type of learning. And the deeper you can learn better. Okay, so that ends my talk today. So sorry, uh, I had if I have I'm um, over time, but uh, let me stop. Lying. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Amazing application. So we had great uh, speakers. Let's thank all the speakers for their great uh, talks. We have we have already gone over time, but we might have sometimes a couple of minutes for questions. If you have. I have two questions from students. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will go through them. So uh, two questions uh, from Brian was that, uh, uh, one is that what will uh, the statistics and data science major and minor entail? Maybe Dr. Bargagliotti or uh, Dr. Loran could answer about this question. Sure. It will be all the requirements for the majors and minors will be in the new bulletin coming out. And then if in the meantime, um, one wants more specifics, they can feel free to email, um, I think, Dr. Shanahan, um, our, de our department chair who has all the information. Perfect. Um, thank you. Um, Brady has asked, what are your thoughts on the negative aspects of deep fakes? Should the average person have access to, ha to have software that can be so dangerous? Yes, I think that's uh, basically the other side of deep learning, how much AI we want, basically. What do you think? Mm, well, I mean, let me take this. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, these are clearly some very negative applications. Uh, what's important at the stage is to be aware of I mean, having an idea roughly of what is the science behind is very helpful uh, to not be. Uh, and it's something general, I think, about machine learning. I mean, uh, like many, many areas of science, there are some terrible applications. There are also some super good applications. It's very important to be educated of what are the techniques underlying all this to be able to uh, make the difference between the good and the bad. Uh, and yes, there are some terrible applications. One need to be aware of it. So I think it's why it's so important to be literate about what are data science because they are becoming such a common part of our life that one need to know how it's work to be aware of the pitfall and the danger uh, of the field. Any other comments? Uh, Matthew Lowe has asked, what are the strategies used to combine text and image data in deep models? Does this ever hurt performance? I can say a little bit about that. And if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. So I think usually you'll have some embedding representation, like a vector of numbers for the text and for your images. And then you can maybe concatenate or have some other fancier way of combining those embeddings. And yes, I think it, if you don't do it properly, if you don't tune the model right, it could potentially hurt performance. So something to play around with definitely. Like how, um, how many layers in your model do you need to have them go independently before you combine them? 
Do you want to join them right away and then have most of the processing together? Those are all good open questions. Yeah, I totally agree, but I just want to add to that a little bit. Um, Matthew, actually, uh, you can think of all the images going through the CNN uh, convolution layers, right? All the many, many deep convolutional layers. And then at the last fully connected neural network layer, like the dense layers, before the dense layers, you can, you can concatenate your uh, text information in there and then uh, combine them to have a, usually I don't think it would hurt the, uh, it would hurt the performance. It should uh, help with the classification accuracy because you're basically uh, taking into consideration more features than just the image. So uh, if you use it right, I think it should help with the performance. Um, sorry, I will need to go. I am teaching a class in two minutes. So if there's one question, I can answer the question. I need to go in two, mi in two minutes. Um, so, uh, OK, so it seems there is a question from Casey. Are there any in inherent limits to, uh, for example, mathematical to deep learning? Sorry, so ca can you precise? So if there is some mathematical limit to deep learning? Yes, inherent. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, well, the main limitation is that we have no idea what's happening. So we don't understand that really the, the main limitation right now. I mean, uh, we know empirically how to train a, a deep learning system and it's worked very well in practice, but compared to what was done before 2012, so what was done in the 90s and in the 2000s, Basically, we had guaranteed, we understood exactly what, what was happening. We had algorithm and we knew what these algorithm we were doing. Uh, and we can, we have guaranteed that the algorithm is doing the correct thing. Uh, with deep learning system, we have zero guarantee that it's going to do the correct thing, which is dangerous. If you run a plane using your algorithm and you know that the algorithm, you know, it's supposed to work, but you are not sure. Uh, that, that's problematic. And that's a big problem in deep learning now is we have strictly no guarantee that it is doing what we want them to do. We cannot prove it. We don't have a mathematical framework. We, have, we don't have a theoretical framework to understand what is happening. Just from lots of experience, we know that it's worked amazingly well. We don't have theoretical backgrounds that explain why it's worked so, uh, so well. Thank you, Dr. Laurent. So let's just have the last question because we are running out of time. I think this is uh, for Dr. Korposik. He said, what efforts are being made to include ASL in the study and processing of natural language processing uh, or co and computer vision applications? Yeah, I think that would fall more under the computer vision side. I know I've seen it at conferences. I don't know the latest of that research though. So good question. Thank you, Troy. <laughs> Great. Uh, with that, I want to ask all the speakers and all the audiences for coming to this session. Uh, 